Welcome home. It's Irish family history with curious news and notes celebrating our sixth year of this podcast at the Irish Roots Cafe, where every day's a holiday and there's always room for one more. One of six broadcast series from the head school at irishroots.com. I'm Michael Laughlin, your host, publisher of rare Irish books and uh, information on every county in Ireland since 1978. Be sure to read our blog, complete with links to click on from this podcast, and search our master index and books for free. Molly, wet the tea, Katie, bar the door, Sweeney, clear that floor, and bring out the Irish dancers. It's time we get this show on the road. Oh, yes, it's show number 201, and we're continuing on from last week with our record broadcast here. We couldn't cut it off to one show. It's got to be two. But among today's podcast topics, and if it's not on the audio show, it's going to be on the blog notes. Uh, Number one, the family name of the day is Maloney. Uh, Number two, the Irish county of the month is County Donegal. Number three, searching for Keating and Flynn and Kennedy and more. Number four, curious notes, uh, prison autograph books. And number two, researching in Sri Lanka. Anybody got any ideas on that? We need some help. And number five, uh, the author of the day is Karen Curtis. And uh, the curious note is when the Joyce work was destroyed. What was going on there? James Joyce, what was destroyed? Uh, You might remember that. And the interview, uh, KU defeats Notre Dame. Uh, oh, Higarty is the hero. More on that in a little bit. Oh, let's see what's happening here this week. Well, I'm going to tell you, number one, we met the author, and that's uh, Karen Curtis, author of P.S. Oh, Higarty. 1879 to 1955, Sinn Féin's Finian. And I've got the ISBN there on the blog with more information. And sure, you can find it at Amazon. And hey, note the front cover on Karen's book. I'll have it on the uh, Enhanced Podcast, and I'll try to stick it on the blog if I figure out how. But on the cover of his book is a photo of O'Higarty himself taken while he sat in his library in the year 1952. I was just a wee child, and we'll put a picture of his book on that po- our enhanced podcast, and uh, it's quite a story. You're going to want to read it, and of course, O'Higarty is a man whose library now rests at KU in Lawrence, and his collection is the subject of last week's show and today's show here at the Irish Roots Cafe. Our thanks to photos for the, from the uh, Special Collections Spencer Research Library and the University Relations University of uh, Kansas for the Higarty stacks. Uh, number two, KU defeats Notre Dame. Here's a note that Jamie L.M. Left, left on last week's show blog at uh, Irish Central. She's, uh, they say, uh, one might think that Notre Dame would have the honor of having the number one Irish library, but I agree with you. I've been to KU and have seen the special collections department. Awesome. It'd be a great opportunity to examine the collection for those who had no problem with time and distance like I do. Someday, I don't think, someday, uh, I don't think people like you get enough thanks for your invaluable knowledge, services, and resources that you share with those of us who are interested in Irish literature, history, and genealogy. Okay, today's interview, we continue walking around the table with Elspeth, and you're going to enjoy it, and we describe all the items, and I think we'll start off uh, real close to the uh, the autograph books from those internment camps. And, uh, well, let's hear what's going on and uh, listen to Elspeth today. Yeah, we have right here two autograph books. Um, the first autograph book is was compiled by someone by the name of Paul Cusick. Um, and he uh, collected autographs from... Uh, now, I'm, I hope that I'm not going to mispronounce this, but it's, uh, let's see where they have it again. Glenna, uh, Frongok, I think, it, which was in Wales, which is where many of the rebels from the uh, Easter Rising were then interred um, and imprisoned uh, following the Rising. And so... Uh, 
which I think it sort of came to be known as Sinn Féin University, right? You had so many people interested in Irish uh, republicanism there, um, and they would swap tactics, and it really became a training ground for um, further movements uh, for Irish independence. And so what you have here, you've got these people in this in this internment camp, and you have one fellow there that has a book, and he says, sign it and put a few words of, of what you want to into it. And they've even got some sketches of the camp, a couple of them in color towards the end of the sketchbook. And it's really just an autograph book. And these are the real s signatures of the real people who were there and just, you know, a line or two perhaps uh, uh, where they commented. So this is a piece of history that can't be beat. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of Irish descendants from these folks too. And there's actually uh, two, two uh, autograph books. Yeah, so um, so this in this same autograph book, and actually here I have it open to a page uh, signed by Terence McSweeney, uh, and, and the O'Haggerty catalog sort of records it's McSweeney, and O'Haggerty actually wrote uh, a book on McSweeney who was... Uh, Became, who became mayor of Cork and then died in Brixton Prison um, on a hunger strike in 1920. Um, but this is before that. So he has signed here and written a little poem as well. Um, uh, but going through, in addition to that, um, towards the end of the book, it transitions from um, Frongach to uh, signatures from 1921. Um, and those signatures are from Mountjoy Prison, um, from those in prison there during... Um, the Irish Civil War. So, these are the people that paid the price for Ireland's freedom. Yes, and uh, and again, if if you're good with your Gaelic and you're good uh, with Irish handwriting, I think these would be of particular interest to you. They are um, sometimes it's a little tricky to read, but they have. Um, all sorts of interesting uh, and often patriotic sentiments um, written there. So uh, definitely worth perusing, really unique um, materials. And a few, a few signatures and uh, comments are even in, uh, in the Irish language, too. Yes. Yes. You know, and some a few poet, po poetic little uh, notes too, a stanza or so. So it's it's really a, an important part of history, and it's a one of a kind deal. And if you had any family that might have been interned in, uh, well, either in Ireland or in Wales, here's a possible source. Yeah, and again, uh, here's another autograph book, and I think we don't have an identification for whose book this actually was, but it's um, from Bally Kindler in uh, 1921, um, and it contains, uh, again, signatures of those who were interred there, um, and uh, you can see here's a little stamp that says, um, good for a uh, one-day prisoner to 217. And oftentimes in these, um, you'll see that individuals identify themselves um, both by their hut number. Um, so here's someone who is signed with uh, hut 32. But then they'll also often give their address of where they lived prior, you know, prior to being brought to the, the internment camp. So that'll be they'll go back to the where the village was in Ireland, and then right next to it they'll have the hut that they were interned in. Yes, and um, sometimes you even get their actual addresses. So if you're interested in tracking down that type of information, um, you can find it. And again, this one has uh, various sort of patriotic sentiments in addition to the signatures. The individuals would write sort of patriotic sentiments, sometimes poems, sometimes sketches, um, and then uh, there are sometimes in. English, um, sometimes in Irish. I saw John John Egan from County Cork, and there's a Nesbitt. Uh, boy, they just keep on coming. Yeah, uh, really sort of rich materials. And again, these are unique things, really um, artifacts of the period. One of a kind, and it was it's 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 immediate. It's not a printed copy. It's the original. Yeah, the original, yeah. Books that were passed around in those internment camps, and of course, not everybody survived those camps either. So uh, it could be a last parting comment for many family histories. And then over here, we're moving into some of our uh, literary materials from uh, the. I guess this is actually from the late. 19th century, but this is uh, an example of local printing. Uh, and in the O'Haggerty catalog, it shows up under the local printing uh, rubric. And so, uh, Connemara 30 years ago, and it um, uses a, a technique of lithography then with hand coloring um, to represent, uh, you know, this period in time. And so, there are um, written lithographic um, 
sort of plates where you'd have uh, the handwritten lithography. And so there are various poems and stories. Well, here's a look at this first line. We had a talk in Joyce's sand with one named Mary Joyce. Oh, she's no affection for her kin. Oh, that's very interesting. The cover said something like stories that have never been told before about Connemara. Yeah, and this uh, item, as far as I can tell, I tried to look it up in WorldCat, which is, um, you know, where various institutions put all their library holdings, and this was the only copy that I could find. Um, so this is, you know, a potentially unique item in terms of items that exist in research libraries around the world. Um, and then over here, uh, one of the wonderful things about our Yates collection is that because P.S. O'Hegarty's daughter, Grania, was married to uh, W.B. Yeats's, the poet's uh, son, Michael. There are actually family copies from the Yeats family in our holdings. And so right here, I've got a copy of a book, which, you know, might not otherwise be of particular interest uh, in terms of, it's actually a translation of, of it's actually French works, <laughs> um, so it might not be a particular interest, except that it has in it a pencil sketch done by John B. Yeats, uh, W. B. Yeats's father, um, who was an artist, as was Yeats's brother, Jack. And so you actually have the pencil sketch here um, that he's doodled, um, and one that's, you know, uh, quite some effort went into it, and then one at the back that's really just a rough beginning of a sketch. Um, so there's things like that, as well as copies that are inscribed from Yeats to his sister at Christmas time book when they were both young. And then uh, the Yeats collection, among other things that it contains, also contains a full run of the Dun Emer and the Kula presses. Uh, and so here is a series of uh, broadsides that were brought out by the Kula press and that treat uh, that contain ballads with uh, woodcuts um, by Jack Yates, and they're hand-colored. And so they're sort of interesting to see because of the diversity of the material that's in there. Um, on one broadside, we have uh, an advice, uh, and it's a, a poem translated by Lady Gregory from the Irish. And then over here, we also have this item that... Uh, <laughs> you know, shows an American Indian. Um, and so I think it's interesting to see how, and there are several that have Western themes um, throughout the broadside. So it's interesting to see how much the American West was an evocative um, and interesting uh, sort of vista and idea at, at this moment in the Irish literary renaissance. And this, and this is a 1908, 1909. That reminds me of a time I would, the, my first trip to Ireland, I drove over there and I th the town I eventually found my O'Loughlin roots at, uh, I thought I'd hear a bunch of traditional Irish music, but of course this was what, in the 80s, 1980s, but I saw a bunch of cars driving up down the street that were playing country music, yeah. American country music. So here we go back to 1908, and here we got the American Great, country. standing tradition yes, of that. Yes. Um, and then over here is, uh, I have two items juxtaposed together that I think are interesting to be looked at in conversation with one another. Um, one is a copy of the poem. Uh, it's here represented as a broadside. Um, Gas from a Burner by James Joyce, and it's a satirical poem in which he writes about the destruction of the Dublin edition of Dubliners. Um, some of your listeners might be familiar that Joyce had intended to publish this originally in uh, Dublin, um, but that the publisher and the printer got cold feet and were worried about how Joyce was representing Ireland and that it was um, they were negative representations of Ireland. And so they, uh, it actually was destroyed before it was ever released publicly. And so Joyce here writes this satirical poem from the perspective of a printer who destroys a work that he thinks um, is bad for Ireland. Uh, and so it actually has Joyce's uh, a handwritten inscription by Joyce at the bottom um, where he talks about how uh, this poem was written, and now I'm quoting, um, in a railway station writing room. Oh, sorry, in a railway station waiting room at Flushing, Holland, on the way to Trieste from Dublin after the malicious burning of the first edition of Dubliners. And so you have an artifact like that that's, you know, really interesting, important in terms of um, Irish literary history. And next to it, we also have a program um, from the Abbey Theatre, which was, of course, at the center of the Irish literary renaissance um, and the importance of having plays related to Irish themes and Irish folklore um, in the end of the 19th century uh, 
early 20th century, and it contains an announcement for um, a play by Yates and other things, and it has advertisements from various businesses around the area. But what it also has is an advertisement uh, for Monsell, the publishers who were to have published <laughs> um, yes. Joyce's Dubliners. And you see here listed in the program, the publication announcement says Dubliners by James Joyce, ready in September. And of course, that edition never came out and Joyce had to wait uh, several years before he actually would then publish Dubliners. Well, you've got the history bef before, during and after, don't you? Yeah. And so I think uh, the thing that is really wonderful about this collection is because it um, comprises material from so many different uh, areas, literature, politics, um, genealogical materials, uh, history, um, because it's so, sort of fa so far reaching in its scope, um, you really have the chance to form those connections and uh, identify original connections that someone hasn't you notice before just because they haven't had the chance to look at this wide range of material. So um, I think for researchers, for the general public, for anyone interested in Irish matters, it's really uh, a collection that can't be paralleled. So. I have to agree with you. I've, I've got a small collection of about 3,000 volumes myself, but my gosh, that's nothing. Yeah, <laughs> nothing at all. Now, what kind of advice are you going to give somebody who hears this and wants to view specific portions of the collection, what work should they do before they get here to make the trip go smoothly? Sure. Well, one thing that you can do is if you go to the University of Kansas Library's main website and you have particular titles, if there's something that you know that you're looking for, you can search the online catalog because the vast majority of items within the collection are cataloged in that online catalog. And you may see that when it gives the call number, it'll say the location is the Spencer Research Library, and it'll give the call number, and maybe it'll say O'Hegarty at the beginning of the call number. Um, if you're curious and you want to uh, just browse the collection a little bit more. If in the online catalog you search O'Hegarty, so O apostrophe uh, H-E-G-A-R-T-Y, um, and just enter that and then select call number search, it'll pull up um, the various O'Hegarty call numbers. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't pull them up in order, but it's a way to start paging through what's in the collection. We also have on our website, um, which is uh, Spencer uh, S P E N C E R dot L I B dot K U dot E D U. Uh, on the website, we have a description of our collections in general, sort of the broad description. Um, but once you pull up sort of that O'Hegarty call number search, it'll look like there's only uh, results 1 through 25. But if you page onto the next page, you'll see, oh, no, it goes on and on and on. <laughs> um, so you can start to skim materials that way. But if you happen to be a little bit closer by and you're in uh, Lawrence uh, or the surrounding area, you might also want to uh, look at the O'Hegarty catalog. Again, that's a really useful tool. We have a copy here at the Spencer Research Library. We also have a copy copy um, at the Watson Library, which is one of the main libraries on campus. Uh, and you can examine those there and get a sense of, you know, start compiling lists. And then... <laughs> and that's not, that's not a small uh, listing. That's like a four-volume set, isn't it's a four, it? Yeah, it's a, a four-volume publication. So you can go through and see um, what's here. And then, of course, the other thing that I would always advise is feel free to contact us, contact a, a curator, contact a librarian. Um, we work with these collections, and we know about the <laughs> what few secret nooks and crannies there are. So if there is something that, for one reason or another, didn't make it into the catalog, we'll, we'll be more inclined to know about that. And we can say, oh, well, this item, for one reason or another, hasn't yet been cataloged, but you know, here's the information about it. Should they call ahead if they have a specific question, and what number would they call? Uh, yeah, they can call um, the main Spencer Research Library number, which unfortunately I don't have at the top of my mind, but if you go to that website, it will be listed there, and that's the main number for reference. Um, anyone is welcome to come, though. What you will have to do is you'll have to register, so just make sure that you leave a little bit of time for that. And essentially that involves uh, showing a picture ID and then uh, filling out an online form. And you can actually even fill that uh, form out online 
before you get here and so that they'll just check your ID when you come in. Um, and again, that's on the website. If you look at the very bottom right-hand corner, there's on every Spencer page, there's something that says Aon account. And if you click there, um, there'll be a little button that says first time user. And you can click there again and scroll through and read also about our procedures for the reading room. We are a uh, closed tax collection, so that means that you can't browse, but then you have the wonderful service of once you request the items, we actually bring them to you in your reading room, so you don't have to <laughs> you don't have to walk around too much. I, it right I tell you, that's awful good service. You can sit back; it's like you were a king. It, it's amazing. You can just sit back and they'll wait on you. And will you bring in food and snacks, or is that uh, prohibited? <laughs> Sadly, food and snacks are prohibited. Yeah, that's uh, you know we want to make sure that these items are available for many, 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 many years to come. But so. there, there are places close nearby where you can step out to take a break and have yes. a snack. Yes. Yeah. Um, Lawrence says, if you haven't been here, Lawrence is actually a really wonderful town. And so you may want to spend some time just walking around Lawrence as well and the university campus. But yes, there's there's food close by, though no food in the reading room. <laughs> That's right. Well, boy, this has really been a pleasure. And I think I first met uh, Elspeth uh, at the uh, um, Saints and Scholars St. Patrick's Day, they had a little uh, exhibit and a little, really a reception. I was it was really great. Had some little snacks there, and uh, they had some music. They were actually singing some songs in Irish, I think. And it was a real treat on St. Patrick's Day. And instead of having the big parade, which I've had for too many years, I got a little uh, a little something new that would really uh, uh, spark my interest. So. Uh, I really want to say uh, a big thank you, and your hospitality has been grand. And it, you know so much about Ireland, and you're, you're doing this. Do you have any Irish connections in your family? Oh, uh, yes. I think my grandfather is Irish, though that, that part of the family is actually cloaked in mystery a little bit. We know that he left Ireland sometime in the early 30s, but we don't know very much about his family. Um, and we know that he had a sister who also immigrated uh, to Liverpool, but that's about all we know. <laughs> And what so. was the uh, surname? Um, so he was a Healy. Oh, so. he was a Healy. Yeah, okay. He was a Healy, yeah. And so we, we guessed that his name was probably once spelled H-E-A-L-Y. And then at one point when he was living in England and was um, uh, – you know, conscripted in the Second World War, it was written down as H E A L E Y. Um, but yeah, so that's 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 my Irish connection. One day I'm going to have to I'm going to have to use these resources to see if I can try and find out a little bit more about my family. I know that I've had family members go back to Limerick. They were in uh, that part of the family was from County Limerick. Go to Limerick and try and research things, but they weren't able, you know, going through the parishes to find what they were looking for. So maybe now that I have this wonderful resource here, I'll try and have to do some research of my own. Oh, and there's there's so much more it's gone online just in the last couple of years yeah. 40 million records i mean it's just dumped online just just in the last year or so it's just amazing what you might find yes yeah well my thanks to the uh, proud representative of the healy clan <laughs> and i wish you luck in the future and uh, i hope a lot of folks come back here and uh, study this but be sure to give them a call and check out what they've got and take advantage of this resource and you, that you're, it's okay you can come in from new york you can come in from san diego we'll let you it's fine just because we have one of the largest collections so <laughs> you're welcome to come in do you have any parting thoughts um no just that this really is uh, any part of Irish culture that you're interested in investigating. I'm sure that we have something there related to it. Um, so please browse the online catalog, and I hope you'll find things that interest you. I know that there really are just great depth in the collections here. So I think that's that's the thing that we have that is fairly unique, um, just the depth of the materials that we have. Well, thank you very much. We may end up getting a special uh, cadre of people to come down here and, and attack the library one day, but you might have to add people to the staff just to handle us. <laughs> well, give us a little bit of warning, but I think we can handle it. We're looking forward to seeing you. So Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, boy, that ends it up there with Elspeth. I'm going to go back there and talk to him, like I said, but uh, we're running out of time on this podcast. The family book of the month are, is Families of Con County Donegal, Ireland, our hardbound book on Donegal families and County Donegal, Ireland, genealogy and family history. Uh, that's our spiral bound book for researchers. And number three, the book of Irish families that contains a couple of hundred Donegal family references to be sure. And that's the master volume to the set. And then we've got to say uh, hello to our master. 
Magnificent Seven, Razor Eyes Skyward, and ask for help. Elizabeth Wilson of, of Hyde Park, Massachusetts. Welcome as a member. Rosalie Zimmerman of Pulley Up, Washington. Welcome as a member. Number three, welcome James Lynn of Battleground, Washington as a new member. Number four, Pamela Hallisey of Toronto, Canada. Your book of Irish family shipped. Number five, Kathleen Fullerton of West Lynn, Oregon. Welcome as a member. Number six, Jane Cox of St. Louis, Missouri. Your Meath and Westmeath Ireland book is shipped. Number seven, a special thank you to Lori Wells of North Richland, Texas. Your Irish family's book has shipped. And her search is for her great-grandmother, Ellen Kennedy, born in Colombo, Ceylon, in 1853. She married great-great-grandfather uh, William Boyd there in 1872 and needs help and... Uh, a clue is that her grandmother says uh, the name was Daisy McGowan Boyd, so she believes McGowan is also a family name, and she needs some help in researching in Sri Lanka. So, hey, get it to me. I'll get it to her. I'll get you in touch, whatever it takes. And uh, hit the family name of the day, we don't have time for all the all the notes, but I've got a lot more on the blog. But it's Maloney, and, you know, there's a lot of those Maloney's over there in County Clare. I knew that when I was finding the uh, the O'Laughlin's. And we limit it. We put that on there. Uh, we uh, discuss it a little bit on the blog, and we have the sources. And that's it. Uh, I'm Michael Laughlin coming to you from the Irish Roots Cafe and Hedge School. It's been great. This has been Irish Family History Show number 201.